Hello, welcome to Barn Blog. And this is the first of what probably will be a series of discussions, um, interrogatory discussions on uh, the structuralism debates, um, particularly as arising out of Althusser, Althusser's uh, revision of Marxism. And, um, and I use that term pointedly and advisedly. Um, the responses to it, the problems of Marxist humanism, um, but also the intellectual genealogy and the logical problems, I think, exist in Altisarian Marxism. Um, the reason why we're having this debate is uh, our discussion. I don't really like saying it, but it implies that you could win or lose, and I don't know that you really can on this one. But um, is that I have argued a lot with um, Nico Villarreal on um, the nature of ideology. I have also pointed um, that I think there are some circularity in the way uh, Altusarian structuralism works. And I, I would even trace that circularity, ironically, back to French readings of Hegel, which, um, but I'm not going to throw the history on to Nico today. Um, I will give him time to read up on what I'm talking about before I go there. Um, in our prior discussions, I have pretended to know less than I do. Um, and I will admit, however, that I am still reading some of the later works of Althusser and that my understanding of Althusser has priorly come from the most commonly read text, which is reading capital, Lenin and philosophy, and on ideology. Um, but let's begin, uh, before I start interrogating the things here, um, let's, let's state, what do you think the Althusserian definition of ideology actually is? Uh, well, I, I would say that uh, the the definition of ideology, uh, ideology is uh, a framework for, I mean, for, for understanding our social reality. Basically, it is a, uh, um, and it, I mean, but it, it's also a necessary part of being like a, a subject in a society. Uh, it is uh, basically what informs um, how, how you understand the things that are going on around you. Okay. So we have um, in, immediately um, a couple of things that are coming out to me. Um, one is ideology is presented as a conceptual framework emerging from, we haven't defined yet, but I'm going to be charitable and say uh, emerging from, let's say, dynamics of class power that uh, is how we conceptualize our influence. Okay, that's one thing that we can pull out of there. And another thing, however, is that it's crucial to social relations and social consciousness. Now, one of the criticisms I've always had of the Altasarian framework is that it actually sometimes, and I'm going to say sometimes, because there are points in which Altasar does differ on this, particularly in the some of the later works I have read, so I'm going to be charitable here. But sometimes there is a near one-to-one -one relationship of class to ideological position. So, and that reads very similar to Lukash's idea about class consciousness and truth, which led to the development of standpoint epistemology. Um, however, Althusser does reject that. I mean, that, that notion, and I know that, and I don't want to portray Althusserianism or Althusser as having that position. 
The position that he actually holds, though, is is harder to discern, um, partly because there is both apparatus is described as a kind of uh, structural mechanism and psychological um, functions described as a structural me mechanism in Altusser, and they aren't always entirely picked apart in a way that is clearly delineated. Um, so to give you a chance to respond to some of that, um, I linked your essay, uh, The Chaos of Power, in the show notes here, and I think I would tell everyone to read it. Um, if you're gonna have to, if you're gonna have to deal with me, you should at least get your stuff plugged. Um, <laughs> so, um, but there's a couple of ways where the definition, and there gets to the murkiness that I'm talking about. And I'm gonna let you defend your own work. I just have to actually pull it up. I have so many things for this one today. Uh, let me see here. Um, all right. So I responded to you, uh, I quoted this at you on Twitter and I said, the, well, I didn't say this on Twitter because I hate Twitter because all the like caveats I would normally put into a phrase I have to drop. So it sounds like I'm being hyper aggressive just to fit into the, the character limit. Um, but I was reading here and I said, depending on how you read this, there's a time problem. Um, let me get to your, it's towards the end of your article here. Uh, and for those of you who have, who are just listening, you can find this at, uh, Palladium magazine, at, uh, palladiummag.com. It's, uh, Nico's, I guess this is your most recent one, right? Yes. Okay. All right. I should As have in it, right. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I finally found it. As an individual, you are not immune to ideology and propaganda. Your personal biases are often difficult to isolate, seeing that they come from the same place as, as rational thought. So far, uh, you're describing psychological mechanisms, but I don't disagree. There's no guarantee that your intervention in society would be any more rational than the status quo, even if you got the opportunity. Agreed. But this doesn't mean the effort to paradigm trust in a superior understanding of society is futile. Agreed, but I don't know why from the logic in which you've adopted. Individual and small groups, while ultimately bound to their own perspective, are able to overcome existing ideology. If we do hard work with care and good judgment, our private discourse can become a coherent alternative paradigm. Any alternative paradigm will be faced with the same structural constraints, but it can handle them better by being more consciously careful in how the world works around them. And I found this interesting because... In one, in one place earlier in the thing, you talk about ideology. I think you give a definition of ideology in here. Oh, yeah. Science and the reproduction of science analysis process require a subject-object distinction. Don't necessarily disagree, but we'll get into the finer points of that. It is well known that true objective knowledge is an impossibility. There's a lot of adjectives doing a lot of work in that sentence. We can never come to terms with things in and of themselves as doing so require God's eye view. Okay, true. To experience the world, it is necessary to have an ideology. This is true whether we are speaking of, of individuals or society more generally. When we first come to grips with external objects, we understand them only as they relate to us. This goes far beyond babies lacking object permanence. When a young girl is asked to write down a description of her family, she will do so on the basis of purely material. She will not do so on the basis of purely material facts. She may reduce their physical bodies to stick figures in art or to an odd adjective in prose. What she emphasizes instead is whether the attributes are central to their relationship to her. The materiality of things, their existence independent of their relation to us is something that we must slowly painfully learn. Now, so far, so that description that's not even Marx, and I'm not seeing this as a contradict as a contradiction. Marx holds this too. That's that's uh, psychology going back to German idealism, that there is un no unmediated state, and in fact, the struggle between mediation and differentiation is how we establish any sense of self whatsoever. But 
you are also saying that is part of ideology. So, and mm -hmm. I mean, I should clarify that there's a difference between ideology and the, the kind of primordial abstraction that I'm talking about with like the girl and the stick figures and stuff. Okay, let's go. So, let's get into this. Yes. Um, so, I mean, when you're like a baby or like five years old or something, and you're coming to terms with those kind of things, um, you you don't even really have a concept of social classes or, or, or politics or any of those kinds of things, except maybe what like random words that you hear from your family and parents. Um, mm. it, it, in order to, I, like an ideology exists, I mean, it's necessary for us to interact with like the social world, um, but we, I mean, that social world, I mean, still exists even as we're working through those primordial abstractions. We, ideology, I mean, if you're as an, on an individual level, you like the you are going to adopt basically an ideology that already exists. It's it exists as a part of the social fabric, um, and it, it develops there, like a, as a part of the process of individuals creating that social fabric. Okay. Um. So this is where the concept of interpolation is so important to uh, to Altisera because an Altisarian, I'm going to say psychology. He doesn't use that word, but I think we have to here when we're talking about individuals. Mm -hmm. An Altisarian psychology. Um, which comes out of um, explicitly out of Lacanian psychoanalysis. Um, although I will also say Altusser does seem to have a criticism of that, and we can get into that later. Um, that the interpolation comes from the fact that it is easy to, once you have engaged in a social relation, to have the definitions that people already have about that social relation be put back on you. The analogy that you used on Twitter um, that, it, that you got from Zizek as the spandrel, which is um, a concept in evolutionary biology where you basically have genetic or epigenetic noise. Um, however, through either sexual or natural um, selection that epigenetic or, or genetic noise can become um, part of the conscience reproduce. Uh, I mean, conscience is not the right word. Um, the, the, the meaningful reproductive strategy and thus can develop into organs and stuff as if it would have developed from the sexual um, or natural selective pressures in the first place. Now, if people don't understand evolutionary biology, I've probably lost you way back there. But the interpolation is similar analogously. And I, as I pointed out to you, one of the problems with a lot of this theoretical stuff is, and this is true across the board, is their analogies, and analogies are the weakest form of argument. But analogously is that you have this need to form a self. You have this need to understand and conceptualize your social relations and thus understand even where you relate materially um, to other people. Um, and the concepts that already exist do the larger social structures that already exist um, can be read back onto those needs. And thus by participating in society you have in a way accepted the definitions and the, the classic, the classic example from both officer and from Zizek is like the cop who has a whistle and says, Hey, you, the moment you turn around and answer it, you've accepted the subjectivity of you. Right. Um, so it's a fair example. Um, okay. But the question, the, the, the question that I get to, is that in some ways Altusser's answer to this seems to be contingency, um, which is stochastic. And a lot of people who even criticize the same kinds of like hyper Hegelian theological Marxism of high Stalinism 
um, rejected this because um, it makes conscious organization against ideology very hard to see how it's possible. Now, all two Syrians, like yourself, well, I shouldn't say like like yourself as if you're you're only an Altusarian because there's other stuff involved in your thought. But Altusarians like yourself do tend to, um, in my mind, have it both ways about the explanatory power of ideology, the consciousness of ideo of ideological apparatuses, and um, and the ability to break free from that, like. Because if you really take the Lacanian like interpret the, the Lacanian psychological framework interpret uh, interpolation seriously, um, it is not just that you are po like positing a bend to history where there is no social antagonism, which I also think is even in communism be somewhat nonsense, right? There will be new forms of social antagonism. Um, you are positing that. In one sense, everyone's view of the world is, as individuals is epistemically limited by ideology and thus self-perpetuating ideology. In another sense, it is unclear whether or not it implies the people perpetuating that ideology are conscious of it. The apparatus idea in, um, in on ideology and, on, and in uh, Lenin and philosophy does imply that it is a conscious effort. But the epistemology, the kind of um, epistemology paired with psychoanalysis that's being used would imply that it's not. And it also, interestingly, gets dangerously close to the way psychoanalyst, uh, psychoanalyst, uh, psychoanalytics is used in the late Frankfurt school before, well, the, the middle late Frankfurt school. So uh, uh, late Adorno, late Horkheimer, um, as opposed to early Adorno, Horkheimer, Grossman, um, you know, pre-1935, or the liberal crap we get from most of the Frankfurt school outside of Raymond Grice. Now, um, I don't even feel like I have to be fair to that, so I'm not even going to try to be. Um, where the consciousness of the social totality from Hegel becomes all consuming and there is no out. Right. I mean like that, that is the, 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 the hotel grand abyss is that, um, is that they, <laughs> is that, uh, in the Frank and that middle period of Frankfurt school, you know, we'd make the joke, like everything is fascist according to this book, but in a way, for Adorno and Horkheimer, it kind of is because capitalist tot totality has so subsumed all forms of consciousness that yes, there's a different consciousness between the bourgeois and and the proletariat, but they're both utterly subsumed to capital in a way that just makes liberation almost impossible, except through uh, negative interventions. And towards the end of Adorno's life in the essay Resignation, it is unclear that he thinks that even negative interventions or anything other than theoretical possibilities. Um, so, so I will say that uh, there's, I mean, there's a lot of different points in there, but yes, ton. Go ahead. I'll let you speak for a while. Yes. <laughs> there are, there are three, I, well, I, I think there are basically two ways that you can get out of this determinism problem and how you can make interventions into politics and history. And the first way is that there's, there's just not just, I mean, we talk about we've been talking about just ideology up to now, but there's not different kinds of ideology uh, analysis mm -hmm. there. That you have ruling class ideology, and you have an ideology associated with like an usurping class, like the like the working class, or potentially other classes in society. It doesn't. I mean, but the, the the main thing that comes along with that is that there's always a possibility that if well, so long that there are certain historical preconditions met. Um, you can have a breakdown and overcoming of the ruling class ideology by a different class, um, which is one way. And the other way is, which I tried to get it in the article, and a lot of it got a little bit, uh, there was a lot cut in that article. Mm. 
um, which you might notice little seams of that being put back together. But um, for example, that last part about uh, like being able to consciously together a different ideology that was mostly just put in by the editors. Um, my original thinking was that you would like on a personal level, this is the second way of doing things. You can just, you, you have to make these judgments. You have to think critically. You have to um, do your own epistemology. And if you are in a moment where like a historical of, of a historical contingency, you can use this information to, um, affect history outside of the the existing ideology and according to your own uh empirics like you you're not gonna you personally aren't going to overcome ideology completely but you can do it so in a way that it, it doesn't like it is not a foregone conclusion from the logic of your society's ideology that this would happen so the example that i would i that i was originally going to give i think some some of it's in there um was of paul volcker okay um which he his the volcker shock had a big impact on history i i think you would agree yes right mm -hmm. and i would argue that that was not a foregone conclusion that uh the tepid kind of interventions to try to stall inflation could have just continued the conviction to end inflation the way that volcker did came from Volcker and his uh, understanding, his epistemology uh, of reality, and which, is which made it a contingent moment where as an individual to make an impact. Now he, he did it to usher in, to help usher in the neoliberal era in, in the particular way it happened. It probably would have still happened in a different way, but it's still an individual making an intervention in history and politics. Okay. so. One of the interesting things that I that I know from Altusser's middle period writing, uh -huh. um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm going to respond to some of the comments in a minute. But one of the things I know from Altusser's middle period writing is one of his concerns about Marxist humanism was actually a minor, an admittedly minor, because Altusser was really cagey about his critiques of Stalinism partly because he was aligned to a Maoist faction of the French Communist Party, and partly because I don't think he totally knew how he felt, um, frankly, uh, knowing a little bit about the biography. But one of his, one of his actual critiques of, uh, of, of um, Stalinism is actually also one of his critiques of Marxist humanism. Because of the focus on agency, according to an individual agency, according to Althusser, this led to, ironically, from the people who are criticizing Stalin, um, they still accept the the agency of particular individuals, according to Althusser, and that the agency of particular individuals leads forth to um, ideological state apparatus, or yeah, ideological state apparatus is positing cults of personality, even if the Marxist humanism is also what we use to critique those individual. Um, political figures. Um, and we see this today in the pro or anti Stalin debates. I mean, most explicitly, like I think about um, uh, the defenses of, uh, of, of Stalin um, from people like Asatar Bear tend to be that it, he is literally the best possible um, thinker that you could have had in the situation given the structural limitations of the Soviet Union. And you have people, uh, I think about Ben Burgess, who will say, uh, yeah, but what about, you know, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact? What about the secret arms deal? What about the liquidation of, like, and, and someone like Althusser would say, those are all empirical facts. They're all true. They're also not particularly relevant. What are the social structures and conventions um, that led to the impasse that led to Stalinism. Now, what's interesting to me is that there are also, I would say, post-Marxist humanist schools of thinking um, that that would say similar, th that, that have similar critiques and still think 
um, there are multiple points of agency. Um, I'm going to respond to this. Historical materialism is so over. It is it is way past time to get real and work towards building a mechanist, uh, material, a mechanistic materialist philosophical foundation for social sciences and praxis. I'm just going to point out that's a logical contradiction. You cannot work towards with your own agency a mechanistic materialist philosophical conception if you do not think agency matters in the first place. If agency does not matter, you have no choice but the way things are right now. And if the way things are right now, the results of the structures in which you can be, all you can do is be subject to the contingencies of history. Now, what I'm trying to interrogate in this is this, I don't think is actually fair to Altasarianism, to be actually. I'm going to say that. That's the philosophy of Stanislaw Lim. That was his critique of Marxism, is that there is no human agency whatsoever. Um, well, I think that, I mean, it, it, there is in a cheeky way a way to reconcile it in the comment, and that's just to say that Marxism is like the, the social Calvinism or the Calvinism of the, the social sciences. Um, and that like, oh, we're doing this because it was always destined to happen or whatever. But the... I think the deeper level, I mean, I think that the 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 Althusserian critique of the emphasis on human agency is that it is kind of a um, I mean, you can't just it's similar to its critique of the, in my opinion, of the idealism of the Frankfurt School, in that the idealism of the Frankfurt School kind of implies, a shift, the, the necessity uh, is a shift in the way of thinking. And it, it, those schools that have an emphasis on, um, and a lot of times this goes hand in hand because they'll posit a direct connection between uh, theory and praxis. Uh, that if you can just, if, if you can get people to just act differently, then it'll all fall apart. You know, if you could, if you could do like um, I know, like a communizer kind of worldwide revolution of people just saying we're going to stop doing value form, um, I, I say I, I somewhat in jest, but then this all falls apart. I mean, you could say that. Uh, I mean, like it, it, I mean, it also applies to the cult of personality kind of thing, uh, but. I think that fundamentally that you what Althusser kind of implies, especially with the, the, the contingent turn, is that if you like individuals can matter, but own not whatever they want. Individuals can matter when there are when the when you have encounters that allow for like that set up the preconditions for a different systemic logic. And that contingency is in moving to that different logic. So individuals can't like this, like you can't say that um, like who, whoever was put in charge of the Soviet Union could have overcome uh, like the, the framework of the socialist primitive accumulation debates. I mean, there were very smart people involved there who kind of laid out the different possible development paths um, and no one going back probably would have overcome that. What you could have had, I mean, you could have had uh, not Stalin and things might have been a little bit different. Uh, the, But there is a certain, but the, the structure of society in the Soviet Union by like the 20s kind of set all this in motion. Maybe if you had, going back even further, you had... Um, a different structure to the Bolshevik party in its infancy, that could have been uh, the uh, the kind of contingency, the people setting it up in that initial moment. But you, the contingency is not like in, um, like the, the necessarily the mindset of whoever is in charge of the, the Soviet Union at a given time, right? Yeah, so, Let's, this is actually a question because when you 
rearticulate some of the stuff back to me. I fail to see how it is not classical Marxism, but even Althusser doesn't think it's classical Marxism, right? Because like when we talk about uh, base superstructure relations, this is something Althusser rejects. Mm. Um, but base superstructure relations are more complicated than just um, capitalism determines everything because the mode of production, because the mode of production itself emerges out of relations and relations of production. So relations of production emerge out of relations. So relationships, social relationships, which are commonly by vulgar Marx is put in the superstructure are actually the basis for the base in the first place. And this confuses the shit out of people, like it, including most Marxists. Mm -hmm. And in there, there have been very smart Marxists um, like uh, Elaine Mirkin Wood, Mirkin's Wood, um, who, Elaine, E.L. Woods. Uh, yeah, let me make sure I get that name right. <laughs> Ellen Mirkin, uh, Ellen M. Wood. Okay. Just make sure I got all the names. Yeah. Ellen Meeksons Woods. Yeah. Um, European names and me. So who like talks about relationships as part of the as part of the superstructure and thus actually ends up saying, well, I want to defend the base superstructure di the distinction, but I really kind of can't because relations are part of the superstructure but they're subservient to the mode of production but and i get that side of a problem with the metaphor it is a metaphorical way of speaking but marx is really clear that relations of production are determinant of the mode and they are part of the basis of of society. So social reproduction includes your relationships. It includes sexual relationship. It includes familiar relationships. It includes relationships of organizing production itself. They, because it's either social reproduction or direct production that is establishing the mode in the first place. And these, if we talk about it in terms of more modern notions of this loop, um, it is, it is a feedback loop, right? And it is a feedback loop in which one's, it is an asymmetric feedback loop in Marxism. Like one is more dominant than the other because the one thing emerges from the other. Um, what I'm interested in is why do you think Althusser felt the need to collapse this model? I get that a lot of, even in the Soviet Union, particularly in the Soviet Union at the time, there is some really dumb writing that talked about modes of production as if they emerged ex nihilo, and then there's just some kind of revolution that happens because I don't know reasons, theological necessity or something, and then, um, and then it fades away. But I would think that the the, the reason Althusser goes through all this trouble is because there's a fundamental inadequacy with the, the traditional Marxist theory of the state. And I think I've mentioned this before, um, that the, what the trouble is that we get into, and what like Lenin gets into, uh, among others, and uh, Althus actually isolates Gramsci as well, uh, but in a different way, is that a lot of times, like a traditional Marxism will have a very simplistic view of how the ruling class um, runs the state and how it maintains its power, and um, like the, there's the simplistic view that they just run everything, and that's like a, a, a straw man of the traditional Marxist view. The more subtle one is something you get when you mix um, like the 18th Brumaire and State and Revolution and some other various things, and you get that, yeah, the, the ruling class will have its uh, interests suppressed in order to, for its immediate interests suppressed in order for its longer term interests. And the state will do this to preserve, the bourgeois state will do this in order to keep things running. Um, and, but that's kind of unsatisfactory 
because now you've introduced a new agent into this model and that's uh, the um the state and mm. what logic does that operate by it's is it just like what what happens when you have those moments of intense class struggle and the state starts to do things autonomously by what logic is that autonomy but uh, according to marx there is no such thing as the state acting autonomously right and that's a problem and that's, that's the, I, yeah i know, I, I know. Th this is this is the, this is what i've been saying for a long time though all marxists after 1920 use the supposed autonomy of the state to to basically retrofit themselves back into lasallian socialism I wouldn't say I, I think that what people miss about that and, and what Alex is there, how it goes beyond Lasallian socialism is to show exactly how the state cannot bring us to socialism on its like um, on its own autonomous logic. Um, not without I mean, like I, you can argue about the dictatorship of the proletariat, but we're talking about the bourgeois state here. Right. And this uh, state has, with, with, with through state ideological apparatuses, which make up a part of this larger uh, body, it exists to reproduce specifically capitalist class relationships, the capitalist property relationships, and um, do that through how people think and how they act and all those different things. It's like the, the, the Althusier, Althusarian theory of the state exists to try and place, I think, exists to understand the state more than like Lazal, who wanted to take advantage of it in a specific way. Okay, so can you go more into that? Sure. Uh, and a matter of fact, there's an example that I wanted to bring up. We're on this. So in the news recently, we've been having. Uh, there's that report about uh, General Milley, right? Have you did you see that? Mm -hmm. Where uh, there was two different parts. There was one that he told Trump that, or didn't tell. He said it to somebody that he's not going to get away with this. We're the guys with guns. They're going to stop if if he tries to do pull in the insurrection act and uh, take the election or whatever. And then there was also a quote that he said before earlier, uh, talking about the Soleimani assassination, uh, where he said where he told Trump. If you don't do this, you're doing criminal negligence, right? So how do we explain this behavior, right? What, um, what does it, like, what's the purpose of it? Is it just, well, and I'm going to say for the sake of argument, it's not just uh, that there is meaning behind it. Uh, and that the Althusserian answer is that the state has a logic to increase, to maximize relative violence. That um, it need that the purpose of uh, that you need to do on the one hand things like what Millie was saying. We can't let the insurrection act get pulled because that'll undermine state legitimacy. Is the logic mm -hmm. there? Versus um, we have to kill so many because this strength. This is our positive exercise the violence where uh, the U.S. military dominance goes up around globally. And that's the basic logic of the, of the state. All right. So to... So one thing you would say is all to Sarah following Franklin Lennon, um, although Lennon only... Lennon talks about relative autonomy of the state. Um, only in times of, of severe social antagonism, um, because of the difficulty in managing capital, there becomes an autonomy um, where the state can go in all kinds of different directions. And I mean, he does, uh, Lenin does pull, to not make it sound like he's being totally a Marxist here, because I want to be fair to Lenin, that has partially pulled... Um, <clears throat> uh, from... Marx's polemical writings around the Brumaire. Um, so, so be fair to that because you do have the emergence of someone like a you know, of Louis Bonaparte who um, represents a coalition of classes that are not classically speaking 
the bourgeois because you're in a moment of social change. Um, those historical instantiations, though, are very limited. And what Althusserianism seems to do is to assume the that that is a almost modal difference between early and developed capitalism is that developed capitalism actually somehow has more state independence than early capitalism. Now, I actually am a little confused by this from you because the logic of econophysics modeling cuts in the other direction, that what you see throughout the 20th century is state dependence on capital following all kinds of probabilistic modes of inference um, because it's need for raising revenue, because, because it's need, you know, for uh, for looking like it has a legitimately funding violence, et cetera, and so forth. Um, so it's hard for me to, to, to reconcile those two things. Um, so allow me to, I guess, make mm -hmm. the sausage for you. Okay. I guess. So I will say that I think it's, I think both those things are true in a way. I think that um, this comes down to the fact that the that the state, the bourgeois state, as it's become uh, more like as we've seen more economic development and we've seen it mature, it's become more professionalized, um, and that professionalism is what uh, gives it its seeming autonomy. Now, I say I say seeming autonomy because um, the ideological uh, like the ideology of professionalism still comes from the ruling class, but it's, it gives it, it has its own um, distinct logic within the state to, uh, to act towards these uh, purposes of maximizing uh, violence or relative violence. Um, the, so the state's become more professionalized, but at the same time, the state is also, uh, been more and more subject to international capital markets, which have developed in part because of its own development. Um, like in, in order to have these uh, international capital markets, which are no longer like um, Britain was able to take control of the East India Company, right? And that was able to give it a large control over um, foreign trade, international markets, or whatever, um, in like the proto like the earlier versions of global trade and all that kind of stuff could be more managed by the state than they are today, I would argue. Um, because you have so many competing centers for capital, um, you have so many more industrialized nations, developed nations, um, that it is, is the reason why like the US would, uh, or why China was able to get away with development like it did. Uh, entering the World Trade Organization and absorbing this huge amount of capital that uh, over accumulated in the developed world. So I, I, I think both of those things are the case. And the, the state is still limited now in, by, this, by these international capital markets, but it is more adept at, um, this, at uh, its particular job of social control. Right. So one thing I would say, a couple of things I would say to this that I've been pushing back on, um, not in the context of Austro-Syrianism, but these arguments of state autonomy have led me to have pretty profound arguments, not just with certain kinds of Marxist-Leninists who argue that China is accepted from the global market for some reason, but also from nationalists who think that the only issue for uh development is that the state has been co-opted by corporations and in the western hemisphere and when I, when i posit that even if you assume that china's um developmental model uh is crucial and i actually do is crucial to the way that it's handled its role in the global capitalist system whether or not you think it's capitalist or not um and that it handles it better than the West, that if you look at its like its state relations to GDP and the fact that it has a business cycle like the West, particularly after about 10 years ago, you can't say that it is that the Chinese state is completely independent from capital. Now, I don't think I don't think an Altusarian, to be fair, 
would say that there was any state absolute independence from capital. I think they would focus on relative independence from capital. And I would also say empirically, which is something I know a lot of Australians don't like talking about, but empirically you can say, yes, China's government has relative, actually relative at a somewhat small scale, to be honest, um, independence um, over individual capitalist firms and the, the, the ability to turn small firms, uh, firms into co-ops, etc. But it's larger social production is still totally dependent on its GDP. Yeah, so I, I think that uh, to, to one to get to the heart of the concept here of independence, because mm. um, certainly the state has never been independent from the interests of the ruling class, but it has been outside of and distinct from class struggle properly. It, it's like it, it's used in class struggle but the state is an instrument, a, a, a uh, thing that like, it's a stick that you use to beat your enemies, right? It 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 doesn't. It's not It's not a part of you. It's something that. So I sorry to get into the analogies like that, but that's kind of the idea. Is that um, in order to understand the the theory here that um, like this the why the state has become more autonomous. Is, is that it's become better at social domination, especially in China. It's become incredibly sophisticated at that. Um, but it's also been, uh, it, it, it certainly it, it's better at capital controls in a lot of other developed countries or mm. uh, middle income countries is incredibly more. Um, but it also, it, it never achieved what it thought it was going to achieve in uh like the, in those goals of, uh, of of development and not yielding to capital, because when Deng opened up the economy, he, he imagined like social like social democracy, but for a developing country, and that never happened. Not yeah, really. social democracy with a developing country, but also squashing um, freedom of speech and stuff, which had actually, I mean, people don't realize this, but formal freedom of speech existed in Mao's China. Um, informal freedom of speech is debatable, but formal freedom of speech did. Um, that was changed after Deng's ascension. Um, but in general, I think you're right. He had, a, he had his idea of, of, of basically like a quasi neoliberal NEP, uh, NEP, um, mm -hmm. on a scale that even the Soviet Union in the twenties under Lenin could not have fathom. Um, and doing so by, by actually out low in producing the West at its own game. Like, um, and it was effective at that, but it makes it interestingly, for example, people will posit about like relative relations between the U S and, and China and talk about like U S and China wars. Well, that's a possibility. It is highly unlikely because both markets are super entangled. I mean, you're, you're talking about number one and number two and the global production schema and, Number two is about to be number one anyway. I mean, it already kind of is in in the amount produced, but it's about to be in GDP. Um, and, and, and GDP and raw GDP, not relative GDP. Again, relative GDP, it's been ahead of us. Um, it is what we were at in the late 50s um, during the post-war social compact. Um, so when I find it interesting because you and I, when it comes to pinpoint analysis, we often agree, actually, on some of what's going on, but our logic for how we agree and what we think is actually the driving forces is different, and it does have some effects. So I'll give you an example of why we had this debate in the first place. Um, and uh, as people are listening, you're going to go, well, this hasn't been settled. It's not going to be settled in one discussion or probably ever. This is why this is a series now. Thanks, Nico. <laughs> um, so you're going to be one of my, uh, irregular regulars because of this, I promise, but regular punching bag. Yeah. Um, I don't punch you too hard. It, I, th that's actually why I do this is because on Twitter, because of brevity's sake and because of the way social competition and, and that works, you, there is an incentive to be frankly an asshole. Yeah. And I don't think that's useful for understanding these debates. Mm -hmm. uh, 
In fact, I was reading uh, before you came on today. I was reading E.P. Thompson's long polemic against all say which I, by and large, agree with. But even in that long graded form, there are times when I'm like, "Dude, chill out!" Like, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> like, like, uh, you know, you don't what have you to saying... go that hardcore. <laughs> mm -hmm. But we were talking today about labor theory of value, and I was, uh, I actually think that in Richard Wolff's public stuff, this is not actually true of his economic writing, which kind of baffles me. Okay. So we can talk about that at another time. Um, the way he states a lot of his ideas um, is easily to turn in. It's easy for it to turn into conspiratorial populism. And frankly, um, uh, state apologia for other states that are still in the circuit of capital. Now, he does not do this, but a lot of people who are educated by him do. Um, and I find that somewhat fascinating. Um, I remember recently when Doug Lane really put his feet to the fire in a parrot room, so this is not publicly available, guys, sorry, um, on, on Chinese development. And he said, well, it's China's communism is why, and then he backtracked and said, "Well, no, China, China is obviously not completely communist. It's still, uh, it's not even maybe even totally socialist, um, depending on that schema. But that they have tried to focus on relative state independence, i.e., implying that yeah, they're state capitalists, but it's not entirely bad, right? Like, um, although he didn't say that either. Um, but I find that fascinating from the guy who literally wrote the Altisarian book on state capitalism, like." Him and Resnick wrote, took Altusarian analysis and applied it to the USSR um, and came up with a new theory of state capitalism based on Altusarian logic, not on um, Marxist humanist or left communist or palmatique value theory, etc. That's a lot of the debate of that, that I said that I think a lot of his public statements are superficially seem clear, but when you really press on them, they're not because I can't tell if he is a value substantialist or not. And I need to define those terms. So you can be a Marxist who doesn't believe in labor theory of value, which was most Marxist between 1950 to 1990s eight or so like the analytic Marxists didn't the uh, post Marxists didn't a lot of the Soviet Marxists didn't even anymore they some of them had even accepted marginalist calculation theorems in the Soviet Union which blew my mind when I discovered that like um because I'm like capitalists don't accept marginalist um calculation theorems <laughs> like like they don't um you don't act, like when you do accounting you don't do that um and uh, so anyway, back to the, the, the point here and that actually somewhat matters. Now I actually have been convinced by the O'Connor physics definition of value, but I think that's an insubstantialist definition. So what do I mean by that? I mean that, um, there's not one thing that you can pin value on that. It's something that emerges from an aggregate of social interactions and you, and the reason why we couldn't model it until we had statistics is because it's an aggregate, right? So you can you can you can model it statistically because you can look at the the aggregate you know chain patterns and start seeing okay if we look at all the prices together and look at all the variable and fixed capital inputs we can actually determine that there is an attractor to price, but any individual price may be above or below even capitalist value, right? That right. somebody might overcharge and, and, and or undercharge depending, but in aggregate, it's going to come out in a wash. Okay. Um, my understanding of historical materialism and is that this is also modelable for human action according to the way, the way we, we see class, when we're just dealing with class operating unconsciously, i.e. for its, uh, in itself. Um, and, and so what, what do I mean by that? Well, 
um, there's going to be certain patterns that just come up that individuals may or may not, you know, may or may not be choosing to follow those patterns. And they may not, they may deviate, right? Like, like we also see this in wages as wages is price there. Th if someone will try to disprove LBT and under an exploitation with wage by saying, well, some people get paid more than others, even in the same field, but that's not the point. The point is the aggregate wage. Um, so I think they, they, to hone in on some of this, uh, especially with uh, what Richard Wolf has said on China, uh, which if you actually go back just a few years to 2015, 2016, he was saying, he was predicting that China was going to blow up with the, mm. the, the, the debt problems it was having at the time um, and then the, the trade war. But the, uh, it, what Wolf is doing and this is different from what econophysics is doing, because I feel like econophysics is trying to build that uh, kind of scientific uh, view that, that we could actually operationalize. Wolf is playing to kind of a, a subconscious a bit, to ideology as it exists, kind of um, ethereally, culturally. Uh, when, which, I, it was something I was going to say earlier, but I uh, did forgot uh, about. I, I really enjoy uh, Eric Fromm, for example, in his uh, his book, The Art of Loving, and its comments on how, uh, like the 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 feeling of kind of existential loneliness built played into nationalism and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and what Wolf does is basically go after these kind of sentiments and create a left economic rationale for them in a way that is kind of deeper at least than something you get on the young Turks or whatever. Well, yeah. I mean, but that's to be fair, that's not hard. <laughs> like, um, I mean, my, my issue with Wolf and mm -hmm. I've said it as many times is when I read Wolf's academic work, I see someone, particularly when he's working with Resnick, but even by himself, I see someone who's very careful and he parses stuff very carefully and there is no conspiratorial agent in what he's, in what he's positing academically. When he talks publicly, that is not true. And it is not that he's necessarily positing any conspiratorial agent. It's just the way he speaks. It is easy to misread it. For example, um, I think this is unclear in Althusser, too, to some degree, but I, I think Althusser's theory of ideology would imply that, like, the, the, it, Althusser's theory of ideology breaks down the class for itself and in a self distinction. All right. Right. We, we agreed that that is broken down by Althusser's theory. Yeah. Okay. And, and there are some ways in which you are, if you are sloppy with the class, for itself, you can have basically a conspiracy theory of capital. Um, uh, Christopher Lash, I know a lot of people like him, and I know a lot of his fans are awful these days, and I'm saying this to write a book about him, but Christopher Lash actually points out that over-focus on the for itself elements of class, when things start to break down, lead to increasingly paranoid conspiracy theories, and he actually traces the history of le uh, of populism, particularly left populism in the United States between 1880 and 1920, as a case study for this happening. So it goes from you know an uh, an agrarian, not a workers' movement, because I don't really know how you classify sharecroppers and Marxist. Like they're not really peasants either. They're kind of weird. They're kind of analogous to peasants. But anyway, but a a laborers. Let's just to to avoid whether or not we're going to have a debate over whether or not sharecroppers are working class an agrarian laborers um, movement that was also aligned by and large with the, with the workers movements and the Knights of labor and its nationalist form and with its vaguely internationalist form in the left of the SPA. Um, but as it got frustrated and could not deal with uh, the development of technocratic forms of labor, the development of the beginnings of, of the core big agribusiness, 
of state subsidies and bureaucratic administration that this focus on the for itself led to basically anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. Um, and that, that actually eventually killed the movement and a movement that was able to take state houses in the United States was like a laughing stock by the, by the middle of the Wilson administration. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, to kind of ping off of that for the curatorial view and how that relates to Althusser, um, mm-hmm. there, like, the one thing that Althusser is very clear to point out is that there has to be that ideology and reproducing the relations of production has a material basis. And that, so when we talk about ideological state apparatuses, like churches or schools or whatever, it, you actually have to have people uh, putting resources and money towards those things and people putting labor towards them. Um, and, and this is something I tried to make clear in my essay as well, that the people, at, this is actually a big part that got cut from the essay too, is that there was a long section on elite, uh, like how you select for elites in the state. And including professionals and mm. what you get in like schools, for example, and we were talking about um, uh, like it, the tweet that sparked all this off was were, econ- eco- were economic departments just propaganda or not. Right. And what I'm trying to point out or what I tried to point out is that uh, the, the, there has to be, individuals who are doing this ideological work, this intellectual ideological work. Mm -hmm. Marshall had to sit down and write principles of economics in order for those ideas to be spread out there. And he had to be paid to be, he had to get his position um, in in the uh, Oxford or or was it uh, Cambridge or whatever. And um, the same thing with Keynes. Is that you have to have you have to find individuals to be these intellectuals. You have and you have to give them the resources to create these new ideologies. That's a structural feature of uh, the bourgeois state and its apparatuses. Okay, so I mean, again, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that. Like the idea that some of the surplus value will be invested into people who could um, answer theoretical concerns are not um, for the bourgeois state uh, are for quasi social. I mean, the, the, what I pointed out to you though, is the history of neoclassical economics, particularly in its middle period. Um, a large number of those people after Marshall were saw themselves as and identified with the socialist movement, not the Marxian part of it, but some like vague, Post World War One social democracy, um, and what I what when when people like Steve King point out that like well you know when capitalists you know train business leaders a you send them to business school because you need to do accounting and not equilibrium economics according to Say's law because Say's law doesn't work. I mean, and that's true. That that I, I'd actually say that's that is a fundamental truth. Um, m- the rejoinder that most people in the economics department and they actually believe this, all right, and I've really tried to push people on this, is that um, the closer you get to equilibrium, even though true equilibrium is impossible because you literally have to abolish time. Um, I'm not kidding. When I, I, I've seen the, the list of conditions needed for true equilibrium and you, it's like... Um, total symmetry and and time and knowledge which would imply no time whatsoever um uh the the closer you get to this the the fairer the market will run now one that's actually premised on a logical fallacy um spelled out by by a Keynesian, not a Marxist, uh, Joseph Heath, who talks about how like there's no reason to assume that approaching 100% or approaching X value is necessarily actually functionally 
more efficient are closer to X value that uh, you could approach and have total system clues that you wouldn't have at a lower part, et cetera, and so forth. Then, then we have to go like, well, why are we positing this, this, uh, this, this economic rule that there is not even that there's no empirical evidence for this model is impossible in the physical world. Yeah. As far as you're on a Mac over, make the same point that in terms of mathematics, the, kind of equilibrium that uh, neoclassical economics posits itself on is fundamentally unstable, mm -hmm. that there's no reason that approaching it um, will actually produce approximate outcomes from what it predicts. Right. So Farjun, uh, Farjun and say the name again. Macover. Macover, yeah. Um, interestingly, come to this concurrently to, to uh, neo Keynesians who come to the same conclusion. Like, which is interesting because apparently like it's just based on good mathematical modeling, right? Like you can't mathematically model an ideal like this. Um, someone in the uh, friend of the frenemy of the show, um, but person I deeply respect, Colin Drum says uh, irreversibility is a big problem for Marx also. And you would say, uh, I think that this is part of what also Sarah is trying to address, right? Um, uh, irreversibility in what respect? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I am, uh, but it, I mean, like, like time preference models and stuff like that being. So yeah, it, in, this is actually a big part of econophysics that you can adjust the parameters to it. You can see whether the transactions can be reversed or not. Um, and it produces different outcomes and you can model that very directly in the econophysics models. But whether yeah. you want time symmetry or not. Right. So, I mean, this actually comes up to our whole determinism and determinism debate. I, I personally, to, to go back, hate this debate. And mm -hmm. I hate it. Like, it comes up. Like, I have, I'll have i have some kind of physicist who'll just, like they did in the comments today, just assert it. And then when you point out, well, even modern physics isn't totally sure if you have causal closure because, actually, because you have, you know, the the quantum non-quantum distinction is huge and also you can't actually predict half-lives for example you can only probabilistically model it but the you either have accuracy or precision but never both so mm -hmm. causal closure is impossible right like um i will say that one of the advantages to altusser is in the very in the very early stages of this research he does try to, and again, it's analogous, and so it's, there's problems with that, um, uh, model that uh, causal, ca non-causally closed determination or like indeterminate determination, which is a contradiction in terms, but people should know what I mean. Like, like that we can't actually unilaterally spell out a single cause in a way that we could predict the future in a useful way. And Althusser, in fairness to him in his, in whatever weird early 20th century proto-science he, and yes, I'm, you know, saying some of my biases here, but like he incorporates into his theory, he is trying to think modern developments in physics into his conception of historical materialism. And while he is critiquing historical materialism, um, he is not critiquing it. I mean, he, he thinks he's refining it. Um, right? Like, yeah. we're in agreement about that? Okay. So I'm going to read what Colin clarifies for our audience. If commodities are assumed to trade at their values, then all transactions must be reversible. I cannot trade a Bible for 10 bolts of linen and then back again. Um... But we we already talked about uh, value at aggregate versus value as price. I I oh, actually yeah. don't believe that Marx thought that value as price was what he was talking about. That is Smith. That is what Adam Smith believed. But you could. Um, I mean, this gets a lot more complicated in econophysics models because when you're modeling, like uh, th th there's certain kind of interactions that. Um, are time symmetrical with like mm. with particle interactions. There's some that aren't. Um, so it's a very, it, it means something more specific there, but it, 
you you can uh, probabilistically work something out about uh, people trading stuff back and forth of uh, and see what that produces. Right. Well, I mean, as an observation, as an individual thing, you cannot you cannot reverse a transaction at, at same price. Like that that's that's an objective fact in in almost any market that I know of, unless unless there is a specific guarantee of reversibility. And not um, as, yeah, not a specific price, but I mean, like the, a lot of the econo physics models don't even really assume like what prices are for any given commodity so like they'll just assume that money is changing hands and the amount of commodities is undetermined because it's not really knowable right and so like i to me econo fix has got got me out of the value debates in a way that the value debates that that in in classical marxism just turned my head head around we i could say that there's not value is not price Value is also not some abstract thing that exists, I guess, conceptually in the universe. That it is, that it is um, the aggregate difference um, between uh, uh, fixed and variable capital su subtracted from the aggregate um income which leads to an average which is an attractor to price prices tend towards that average um but any one price will not be that so like i can actually probably blow your mind here with a little a bit okay, of this ahead. that in in Wright's formulation with the super integrated labor mm -hmm. um uh, values you can just you, what you can assume is that you have a really existing price and you can divide that price by the average wage and that when you take the super integrated uh, labor values um that these that th what will converge is this ratio and uh, the labor val and uh the labor expressed per commodity yeah so that's interesting and it does but, act you know, mm -hmm. good. No, no, but but it, it 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 does say, for example, I mean, one of the things that I think Alcana physics does posit mm -hmm. is you need a probability to be able to model all this. And I, I do think about for like for example, when Marx was playing around with math and he was trying to invent something like um a dialectical calculus, <laughs> like because he thought that you needed a new math that didn't exist. Now his math notebooks are to be frank, an unforgotten, you know, like a God forsaken mess. Like they are. Um, but he did have a key insight about like trying to do this on classical calculations. I also think um, that the MMT is one like overall, or I shouldn't even say MMT. It's not just MMT to say this, but they say it a lot. Overall point about the way Marxists have assumed that, uh, um, economics works like physics the way, frankly, even classical neoclassicals did. Um, but their model of physics is Newtonian, um, is maybe fair. But if you start incorporating statistics and like and in, and in some indeterminacy into it, that goes away. Mm -hmm. Um, so. Yeah, there's a lot here. I, I would say, you know, um, I would say there that we've hit on a bunch. I don't want to take up all your time today, and we didn't even begin the answer to the questions. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about the again. We I mentioned the context of value theory. You said this in response, not so much to I mean, kind of to me. Although what I said was um, just like I I I believe in LVT, and I think people who uh, do not have any concept of labor theory of value um, are our um, issue. And I mean, are, are just wrong. But I, I do, th I actually do think there's been historical uh, 
complications to the Marxist picture of development of economics. Um, uh, one of which this, that um, is the, the Marxist assumption that money has a price. I mean, money has no price, which it actually does, or that markets have no cost, which they actually do. Um, and I think those are real. Um, but, and I, and I say that because it might be thrown up in some of the other things we're going to talk about today. But I think that I've been interested in these value form debates because value form debates um, are predicated on pretty strict historical modes, right? But, um, and so I actually so is econo physics. Um, but you, in particular, become the rabid classical Marxist when we talk about value form stuff. And it's related to your Altisarian critique, but that's when you sound the most like, you know, uh, uh, 1890s Marxist. Would you like to say why one is tied to the other? Because, because our debates about this is actually what brought up the Althusserian stuff today, which I was unex, which I found a little bit unexpected. Right. So, I think that um, I, I guess this kind of relates to my understanding of the history of economic thought, right? And I, I write that to the. Um, uh, now, now, this shouldn't. I mean, the history there. I don't think substan like substantiates the claims of classical LTV as a, as a, uh, um, as a scientific theory. Uh, but I do think it has scientific basis um, and that it, it has, it's only in its understanding as a quantitative um, like theory, as a theory of uh, exchange ratios and it has a relation to price um, that it has any scientific theory basis um, but to relate that to Althusser, I think that, um, actually I could relate more directly into what, like, uh, well, I, I can relate it to what I think of like scientific development that, that what Marxists did, um, well, we took the, uh, the ideas of uh, classical economics, pl uh, classical political economy seriously. And we did that in a way that allowed us to move beyond the kind of subjective class view uh, or the, uh, the, the, the point of view that was necessary for it to act as a ruling ideology, right? And that was a genuine scientific insight. Uh, it wasn't it wasn't a complete science. It wasn't like correct a hundred percent. It still needed work, which is why I believe in the econophysics project moving it forward. Um, but it was a genuine scientific insight because it moved beyond the that that subjective point of view um, of the of the ruling class ideology. Now, the neoclassical economics kind of came onto the scene through off those assumptions and they did so because it was ideologically convenient. Um, now the science, like they picked up like ideas that were, uh, I mean, somewhat, I have, I mean, there's big problems with the neoclassical framework in that you could say that it rigorously describes something, but it, it, it is completely asking a totally different set of questions that the classical political economy was. Yeah. It, I would agree with that. Yeah. And, the what Marshall did is uh, to find a way to reinforce uh, state ideology by throwing out those assumptions and moving to this, in my opinion, less scientific basis for economics compared to classical political economy. Now, there are people who took that framework and ran with it. There is always people trying to understand reality and doing so with whatever ideas they have at their disposal. Um, I think Lange used plenty of neoclassical framework things. There are plenty of other socialists who did. Um, the, it, I it mean, marginalism was arguably 
brought into existence by socialists. So, um, which is, which, you know, like you want to talk about historical mistakes, right? But like, <laughs> um, I mean, it's not really there. I don't blame, there are lots of marginalist people who came before Marshall. Marshall is the one who turned it into, he didn't even, I mean, he took, he created the Marshallian cross and integrated it with like costs, uh, like the marginalist mm. was like a, cost curve and supply and demand, but he's the one who turned this whole thing into a state ideology, state ruling class ideology. Um, I mean, I, I find that we, we get into the cul-de-sac of like debating the, like I do with Tom O'Brien, like Tom will just be like, well, you know, the, the bourgeois obviously knew what they were doing. And, and I'm like, I don't know. I think they were throwing money at a bunch of things and the things that got the most money and stuck um, were the things that were effective, but yeah. I don't think they were actually thinking about it in any conscientious way whatsoever. Um, and I, you know, I, I, which is not to say that they, that like individual or even collective, like the bourgeois acts a little bit, a little bit more collectively than the proletariat does right now. But, um, and you do see people who actively advocate class position, but it, it my, my fear is that, and I, I don't think this is something Altusir is actually guilty of. And so, again, you know, I have my problems with Altusir. We haven't even gotten all of them, but we've gotten to some of them about, about some of what I think is going on with the weirdness of the ideological framework, um, how I can't tell if it's circular or not. Um, but the, the points about how, like, dominant stuff you can explain that you know Altasarian's explanation does not require anyone to be consciously guiding any of this that you know it's just oh this is convenient for certain people in capital so they give it money and then it becomes more dominant and it becomes more convenient and it becomes more dominant and you have you know an investment feedback loop well i would actually like to put a little wrinkle in this because i don't think that it was the bourgeois directly that uh, did this, that did that. Okay, go ahead. Uh, that was Marshall. I think that this is actually leading into the the deeper theoretical understanding of the state of uh, Cambridge University, for example, as a state ideological apparatus, um, which is where we got both a neoclassical Marshallian economics and Keynesianism, um, and the. It's the state that's basically, uh, as um, through its support of these institutions, and there's certainly there's more private support now, but that is is pushing these things forward. Um, I want to tie this though back to like the value form debates because okay, because um, that's how we started this whole debate in the first place today, and what what arguably will now launch this multi part series where we talk about where you and I differ on relations to structuralism. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that the, the, the people who really support like the value form kind of understanding today, the people who uh, really love Heinrich, um, that there's a certain, a lot of these people buy into uh, neoclassical economic, mainstream economics. Um, and in part, they see no reason to build like an, like they, they don't want Marxism to be a science, right? In in that way, there's no reason for it in their view because science already exists. It exists in this state ideolog ideological apparatuses. The the immense power of uh, econophysics and these other similar projects, including Althusserian's theory of history uh, and politics, as it exists as like a scientific uh, social science theory, um, is that. It allows us to have um, to to give this naturalistic kind of support uh, for a proletarian class power as a political power in the same way that neoclassical economics gives its support to the existing ruling class and it's providing the naturalistic arguments there. Okay, um, so. Hmm. So your issue with with value form theory is that its fungibility could make it more 
uh, susceptible to being reincorporated into already existing neoclassical uh, ideological understandings of the economy. I think that I think that it, it, it surrenders those fears because it, it it feels like those were already lost. I think that's a big mistake. Value forms claim, uh, and uh, one of the things that Cordelia was saying here a few weeks ago, or uh, however long ago it was, uh, was that the, the what the strength is in, is in making an explicit normative claim. And my uh, claim is that making an explicit normative claim is actually less strong than making an implicit one via um, scientific naturalistic arguments. I see. Okay. Um, so you would not... You would not accuse Cordelia of the uh, of the kind of super vulgar thing that I just said right there that you know it's totally copacetic with neoclassical ideology. But you would say that because it is weaker, because it is making a weaker claim, because it is more fungible, and it is. I mean, mm -hmm. value form is more fungible. But one mm -hmm. of the things I pointed out to 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 value formers is it is weird that hyper left communist to hyper social democrats people to on the socialist spectrum to the well to the right of you um and when i say right here i do not mean that nico is conservative i'm just saying that he's on the he's on the left end of the social democracy but that's over here um, well, <laughs> where we, whatever we get relative camera <laughs> yeah. I, I could draw the spectrum damn it um <laughs> it, uh that that it's interesting that you have value formers basically at in all categories of of the socialist spectrum which would indicate that it doesn't have that much strong contentive uh content i made up that word it doesn't have a, a whole lot of a substantive direction to what it's doing within socialism other than fighting against certain uh, like maybe straffernism or something like that um I also think we got man, man. There's a debate going on about physics prob and probabilistic uh, things here. What I'll say is, um, all probability models seem to vaguely come out of physics because physics is a foundational model. However, the differences in complexity effectively mean that like modeling biology is totally fundamentally different than modeling a physical transaction. Cause there's infinite more, there's infinitely more complexity. And when it comes to social complexity, which has all the embedded biological complexity, plus all the shit humans do that make it even more complicated. You have even infinitely more than you have multiple infinities of more complexity and I'm going to let you ponder that multiple infinities is a mathematical thing. And you can just like go slowly crazy about that over time because that seems to be what it does to people. But yes. Um, but I still think, you know, um, if you can't model, if you can't have some model from somewhere, you don't, you don't have anywhere to go. Um, but pretending like economics works like Newtonian physics, that's, I mean, if anyone does that, they're, they're dumb neoclassicals do it. I do think a lot of classical Marxists did it. I mean, like, I will, I will say that. They tried to, real hard. Um, uh, so, um, I'm also going to point out some of these debates are relevant to a discussion I'm going to have with Colin Drum in August about how, how he thinks German idealism set us back a thousand years or something. Um, I don't know if he would say it that way, but uh, probably. I mean, he might even say it more inflammatorily than that. That's Colin's, that's Colin's like modus operandi is to, be, is to, to state something uh, the, the most inflammatory way possible and then and then nuance and define it in dialogue but um <laughs> uh so so it, it'll be relevant he's in the comments today um i might actually make this an audio one too because it's relevant to the Cordelia episode so i think i stay in the thing that i'm only releasing this to patrons it might be released to everybody because uh nico you held your own pretty well um on i don't know when we're going to do this i'm trying to cut back on my content production because i have a day job and i have to actually do it and and whenever i'm like i'm gonna have this spontaneous stream with somebody i'm always screwing that up um, but I want to thank you for your time and say next time though, I'm going to give you some reading for you to respond to. I'm going to actually ask you to read 
the sections of the poverty of theory on E.P. Thompson talking about Althusser, because what I'm interested in is I was noticing that he does cite Althusser some, but he cites Althusserians a lot. And I'm going to be interested if you think the issue is um, 70s new left Althusserians or Althusser himself, or if you think that E.P. Thompson's being totally unfair. Um, because I will say, when he nails some of the Althusserian arguments by people in Britain in the 70s down, they look ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, and I've gone back and checked some of them to make sure he wasn't just totally decontextualizing them, and he's not. But it is unfair to blame a theorist on their on their subsequent interpretations, because if we do that for Marxism, oh my God. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, like, the, 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 like Marxology in some ways is a sign of our stagnation, right? Because if we were actually totally, if we had a totally functional science with a totally functional research plan, uh, uh, exegesis would not be necessary. We don't exegete Darwin. We just don't mm -hmm. like, that'd be pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> like, I mean, cause you know, like. Darwin doesn't have a mechanism for evolution it's in, like at all. It's not there. Um, it it kind of takes a weird priest in Russia to give it to us. Um, but, um, you know, and so I do get that argument. I do think like, I, I think the, can we make Marxism a scientific research plan or can we make, so maybe even better. Can we make socialism even getting the Marx out of it for a second? Um, more scientifically oriented and less full of alienated bat shittery. Um, it'd be great. Um, but I'm going to give you that. Maybe you can respond how you think the, uh, they are fair or unfair. Um, and we might also talk about arcana physics. Cause one of the things I'll say is arcana physics are not arcana physicists who are Marxist, which by the way, is not all arcana physics. There is non Marxist arcana physics. It is um, not, the majority of economic physics who focus on production, though. A lot of the rest are in finance. Right. So the, I was about to say, like, there's production economic physics and finance people. Because I was reading criticisms of economic physics, and I kept on getting criticisms of finance economic physics. And I was like, well, that's not what I'm talking about, even though it uses some of the same models. Um, and some of those criticisms were better. I didn't actually see that many responses to far drawn and Mac over actually. There's it's uh, so hard to find anything, any meta commentary on this. There's like one review of classical econo physics in any journal, just one. Yeah, that's, that's, that's weird to me. Cause it's like, cause I was talking to someone about this and I was like, Hey guys, this gets, you know, a lot of our problems that we have about whether or not value is price or not price or is magic out of my butt are like, whatever. Um, and, and you, you say, Derek, you're being totally unfair when you say some people believe that value is, there's some people who have a substantial view of value that has no relation to price. I have no idea what that even means. Like, I'm like, so it's this, it's this third thing that we have that are, that is objective, but doesn't exist and has no analogy to anything we can measure even in statistics question mark like that's that, that's that's magic man um <laughs> that's a real commodity fetish <laughs> um so so yeah but and there are people who posit that i mean uh there's also non-substantialist forms of it that basically makes it a moral argument Mm -hmm. Um, of non-substantialist, non-aggregate, and and everyone's be like, ah, oh, Derek, she's an eighty. So who's the guy? It's, it's the the main, the big uh, Harvey. Harvey, that's yeah. Harvey. Yeah, it is. I mean, but ultimately, uh, Harvey just—if you really push him—he just doesn't believe LTV at all. Like, right. like, um, um. So yeah, we we can uh. We'll talk about this more in the future. Thank you for coming on. Um, I'm going to send you in the next couple of days. It's in the links here too. The the e, the E.P. Thompson piece, if you haven't read it. I'll send you the internet one because there's the... the I haven't uh, pulled up already. Okay. The, the, uh, the one that's published by Monthly Review, 
has a whole lot of other stuff with the ba- which are, which is interesting because um a lot of people tend to think of E.P. Thompson as something more like Kolakowski. Um, and if you read the whole thing, there's a a hundred page letter attack on Kolakowski, which is even meaner than the attack on Altusair. Um so uh I think you'll find it interesting. Um uh probably in about two months. You don't have to read anytime real soon, but um, I'll be back in touch with you and we'll continue this. I even made a special uh, banner for our series on this. So, you know, it's going to have, I'm not wasting my time on doing that only once. Um, so <laughs> thank you. Um, so thank you, Nico, because I, 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 just so you guys know, um, I can be mean to Nico and Twitter comments. <laughs> Like every now and then, I'm just like, "You're not a Marxist." I kick you out. Like, <laughs> like you're gone. <laughs> Yeet. Um, <laughs> and I have to, I have to fight my inner Stalinist compulsion uh, to yeet everybody who disagrees with me ever. Um, I, I, you could say my inner Stalinist, or maybe my inner Platonist. I don't know. It's, it's the bad idealist part of my head where I'm just like, "You're messing up my mind palace. Go away." <laughs> like. <laughs> Um, um, and instead of doing that, I always end up asking you on the show and being grateful that I did. Um, you're welcome. Yeah. Um, the Nico debate series will rise up against the false economy between Nico and Bard. You know, it'd be interesting if you guys actually develop some new third tendency out of this that neither <laughs> one of us adopt. <laughs> Uh, like uh, var, like Varn via realism, which is neither Varnism nor via realism. Um, uh, but a uh, 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 of a third thing, and I said that just to upset the anti uh, idealist in the group. All right, uh, have a great day. Thank you for coming on in broadcast now.